Welcome back to the Cog Weekly Podcast, Season Four, Episode Four. Not in our usual no, we're not studio. in our usual no. place right now. It's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. We are currently away on a vacation. We're here with actually producer Sutton. Yes, we are. We which are. Which is amazing. You can probably hear his keys rattling in the background. But um, yeah, we're we're on vacation right now at a cabin, which is super fun. But it meant that we couldn't be in the studio to do our normal or usual intro to an interview. This episode is an interview, if you don't know by the title. But we're just going to get into that interview really quickly so that we don't hold you guys up with anything. No Hassani of the week this week. I know you're disappointed. I know. I'm sorry. uh, It's terrible. It it really is. Yeah. But no Hassani of the week this week. There wasn't much happening anyway. No. Um, And then predictions last week you got. Uh, I went two and one. Yeah. And then I went went one and two. Yeah, you had Lugano. Some some stupid things happened. I, I don't even know. I don't understand it. But uh, yeah, we're we're just breezing right past both of those, and for uh, the best, I think. Yeah, one hundred percent. And yeah, we're gonna get you guys right into the interview with Jose Ferreira. We hope you enjoy the the really good and insightful information he had about about his journey to becoming and being a professional footballer. So we hope you enjoy. Thanks. All right, welcome to the third interview of Cog Weekly Season Four, the interview series. We've already done yes. two with different people involved in the soccer market. And this is our third one with Jose Ferreira, a 23-year-old right back who is born in Lisbon, plays in the Finnish football system, and has a wild journey to share with us. Jose, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and thank you for what you guys are doing. Because yeah. obviously, you know, there's a lot of football's a massive industry, so many people in it, and a lot of stories, you know, uh, go unnoticed. Uh, and I think what you guys are doing is great to get a lot more stories out there and to learn a lot more about football. So thank you for what you guys are doing and thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. It's really highlighting what we're trying to do. Yeah. So you're from Portugal, specifically Lisbon. I just want to say I have actually been to Lisbon before. I went with my family. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I went with my family in I think it was 2018. And I don't know if you know these like couple of things, but th- th- my memory of that time it probably should be better. It's not great, but I yeah, still I remember a couple. It's of not things. that long. Ago. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not long enough ago that <laughs> I shouldn't be remembering, but I don't sometimes. Uh, but we went to Kaish Kaish. We went to a restaurant in Kaish Kaish as well. Where I'm from. Really, you're really? from Kaish Kaish? Yeah. No yeah. way. That's, 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 where I'm that's from, so man. funny. Wow. So we went there. It was beautiful there. So cool. The scenery is awesome. It's a great little town. If you're ever in Portugal, go to Kaish Kaish. I, I, I have to now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also we did some hiking in a forest. I can't remember the name of the forest. And then we saw like the the Christ the Redeemer of Portugal, and then also yeah. like the replica Golden Gate Bridge, which was so cool to see. Both of those. Things, it was a very memorable trip. Although I said I don't remember. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Yeah, who, who would have expected that? <laughs> yeah, it, it's know, so I've funny. Been there in so long as well. <laughs> really? Wow. So yeah. is there a chance that I was in Kaish Kaish? earlier than you were like <laughs> related to now like was most i recent. was i the most recent person to be in cash cash <laughs> probably yeah <laughs> probably, that's actually, crazy yeah. i'm trying to think 2008 obviously I, I nip back and i'm home but like i don't really like i don't leave and go out because i'm only back for like a couple of days at once so i never really yeah. go to you know like you've definitely been to the the, the golden great bridge or the equivalent i've been to yeah. 25 Gold. That's crazy. Uh, it's so there, funny. More often than I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably went to the more touristy areas. True, you know, like what true. tourists normally yeah. go to. It, yeah. In perspective to what you might, you might go to actual places that are better for actual culture. Yeah. Than, than most tourists, but it was a super fun trip. I really enjoyed it. I just wanted to mention that, and it's so funny that you're from like the place that we went to. That's yeah, hilarious. Yeah, it was crazy to hear. I wasn't that, expecting that. <laughs> yeah, this was not planned at all. No, this was so people know this wasn't planned at all. So you're in Finland right now as well, right? Yeah. So I'm in a town called Kajaani, which is technically central Finland, despite being six hours from Helsinki, the capital. Okay. Uh, so like even beyond Kajaani, they're still like more towns so Rovaniemi, Kemi uh it's a lot of towns it's a massive country it, it all is seven percent of the population i'm pretty sure is in helsinki so everything else is just okay. a bit like you know everywhere yeah because <laughs> yeah. the majority is down in, in helsinki but it's a it's a nice little town i'm enjoying the experience yeah I, really it, different from anything i've experienced in the past it, it must be it must be i was looking at the weather in helsinki earlier today 
And so obviously you said it's six hours away, but probably relatively similar. It said like 65 for Fahrenheit. I don't know the Celsius translation, yeah. but around like room temperature and sunny is generally what it's like in the summer, which must be beautiful. It's an awesome time to be in Finland. Yeah. Honestly, like the outdoors here, the outdoors life is amazing. You can yeah. the hiking. There's lakes everywhere. I, I don't know the exact number of lakes in the in the country. It's probably something like eleven thousand or something. Wow! And uh, there's just so many views. It's, it's beautiful. That's I think like w- one of the the things I've enjoyed the most about the country is every time we have an away trip. So our away trips are quite long. Probably not long for like USL standards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the trips are a bit, a bit bigger, but. <laughs> From for what I'm used to, this it's like six hours, some of them five hours. So and we're on the coach the whole time. We get to see everything, and it's it's really beautiful. I've got like loads of pictures on my phone. I love taking pictures out the windows every time. Nice. So you always see something new. It's beautiful country. Yeah. That is awesome. It's probably kind of similar to where we're located. I was gonna say yeah. Yeah. So we're in we're from Minnesota in the U.S. So like center north. So like we're the most probably the most north state mm-hmm. or the coldest state yeah. at least yeah. in I the mean, U.S. In <laughs> You yeah, have, really. You have. So yeah. that's where we are. That's where we're located. Yeah. When wow. were you in okay. Minneapolis? Uh, We've both been Africa. to where each other are from. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I played in the Dallas, I'll get, like, get into it later, but I played yeah. in the Dallas Cup in 2017, and our connection was in Minneapolis. We were there for hours. Wow. Oh, great. <laughs> that is so cool. The Minneapolis airport's actually pretty nice. It's pretty nice, right? It, it's, it's not bad. I, I don't know if you remember. Really nice. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very similar. We yeah. How are you dealing with the cold weather over in Finland? Because obviously Portugal doesn't get the same cold weather and also short days that finland and north scandinavia gets it was it was tough to get started when i came that was like the most snow i've ever seen in my life yeah. uh, like I, I remember i think one of the days that shocked me the most because we cycled to training and at the time we were training in a it was kind of like a, a dome so it was the first time i'd seen one of those as well so just a full inside side pitch in a dome it's called the palo Ali. And to be honest, I, I thought that was like the coolest thing because I'd never seen one of those before. But apparently, they have one in every town. So for yeah. them, it's like normal for me. Yeah. It was new. And yeah. I was walking around in the snow, and from, it was all new. It was all a new experience, and I loved it. Um, it was a bit difficult after training. So you finish training and you go home, and it's super dark, and you're like, "It's cold. It's really cold." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you, you just you get used to it. And I've lived in so many different places now that I've pretty much adapted like quite quite quickly to things. I feel like I could go anywhere and just adapt to it now. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we can kind of relate to that too because Minnesota, pretty much from like October, November until spring, we play in domes as well. And even though like we'll have practice at like 5 p.m. and it'll be dark out and it'll be like that. It that is tough, but um. We can move on to more the the very start of your career, you could say. Like, what made you get into the game of soccer? Was it um, your favorite player growing up? Was it a family member or, like, watching the World Cup? What was, like, your first memory? Or all three, which yeah. is the case for me. Yeah. What was, like, your first <laughs> yeah. memory? First memories of soccer? So, first memories are going to... I'm a Sporting Lisbon fan, so mm-hmm. that's... Uh, I still remember the stadium before the new stadium which was, I think, the new stadium was 2003, so that would have been for the Euro 2004. Okay. And I still remember going to the old stadium with my dad, and uh, that was my first step into football. So I, the first couple of times, I, I, you know, as a kid, I take my little toy cards and stuff. I was, yeah. I was keeping I keep track of it, but I get distracted at times. I remember once we, we got that off time, and I was like, okay, get over, we're going home. <laughs> <laughs> I decided we were going home. I must have been like four or something. Yeah. My dad was like, kid doing he's trying to watch the football (laughs) but you know that was like how I first got into football and then as I grew up I was growing up with it around me so I just kept watching you know and that's where one day I decided I wanted to play it so I remember my first step into playing football was at my school you know the school teams even like you know just kick around kick about with kids when you're like eight six seven you know it wasn't like an organized team. It was just like you, you, you fun football, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Just a start. And then uh, eventually I started taking it more seriously. I was, uh, uh, it was like a kind of a trial thing just to see how it went. And uh, it went well. I think from what I remember, they wanted me to stay longer, but the sporting academy isn't actually in Lisbon. It's in uh, Alcuchet, which is um, a couple of hours away. Well, an hour and a half maybe away from Lisbon. So obviously as a kid, that wouldn't have been very easy for my parents as well. So they decided, no, you're going to study you <laughs> can play football locally if you want, but you're not going to take, you know, you're not going to be away from home. You're not going to be doing this. We can't commit to the travel. 
and at the time I was going into a good school as well so my priority was education yeah it's always been in the background of my education so uh and then one day I went with my parents to have lunch at a restaurant so that would have been Kerkevelush I don't know if you remember when you went to Kaskai's uh, yeah yeah I, I see that word as well in the so transfer market sort of describes you, yeah you, and it says <laughs> grupo sportivo de carcavelos uh, that's the and, one okay so that was sort of like the next team that you stepped into in your in your youth career yeah so that was i'd say the main youth one so okay. there was a bit of like a sporadic break between when i went to sporting and then i just played for my like the fun football thing again mm-hmm. and then i went to uh oh actually even before kukavel I just completely forgot about this one. <laughs> um, I, I went, so it was like part of my school, but it was like a sc- football school thing. So and I remember we went to England in the tournament and I was a striker at the time. And because uh, I think my keeper was conceding, I just said, I'll, I'll go goalkeeper. I'll try it. You know, you're a kid. <laughs> <laughs> this was a game against Coventry City, like little, the same age group. Yeah. And I did really well as a goalkeeper. And they actually asked me to stay and keep training with Coventry City as a goalkeeper. <laughs> And this was like no way. Like, I was like a kid. I was like nine or something. I don't yeah. remember how old it was. And that was my. I guess that was like fate saying, "Okay, you're eventually coming to England." But yeah. like, I didn't know it at the time. That's uh, my parents crazy. Were like, you were a child. You were not staying in Coventry. Yeah. <laughs> Coventry. Well, that's that's what I'm yeah. thinking when yeah. I hear that story. It seems so alien to me to yeah. leave your family when you're nine years old. And go play for a football academy. And that's because I'm from the United States. You hear about it in England and and in Europe all the time. Kids leaving and going and playing for football academies since they're like 8, 9, 10. But it's so alien for me, at least. And it seems like your parents felt the same way. They were like, no way are you leaving us right now. Yeah, because I think what a lot of clubs try to do as well nowadays is they try to like relocate the family and then they'll give like try to find a job for the family and all that. So they try to like, I think there's rules about it nowadays. So I don't think you can do it that easily anymore. Mm. This we're talking about like 11, 11, yeah. 12 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Things are like were a bit different at the time. So I don't know how it works nowadays, but that's what happened at the time. Yeah, and my dad's job was like, quite good I'm, I, he would have never left it <laughs> for me to go have a kick him up for Coventry City <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was okay so it was like one of the the first steps I guess into football and then Grupo Sportivo Kerkevelish came in because me and my parents went to have lunch at a really good restaurant and uh, they had I noticed they had like a football pitch outside I, was, I went out wandered off to the football pitch there was kids training and I was like okay there's a club like a couple minutes away from my house you know dad can I come train here and he said no and then <laughs> while they were having lunch, I walked off and went to speak to the the guy that would have been running it. He was like, yeah. can I come train next week? <laughs> wow. So they were like, that's okay. Are your parents okay with it? Yeah, man. <laughs> okay, bro. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened when and your parents I, found out about that? Oh, I came back to the table. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm coming to train on Tuesday. I just need a left place. <laughs> It was something That's like crazy. something along the line. Yeah, yeah. it got sorted. It came and it was like a trial, and I trialed for a week. And I think I was like 12, 13 at the time. I can't remember exactly. But and then I stayed for a couple of years. I ended up captaining the team. I ended up uh, playing a year above. Uh, I was there for, a re- for like a couple of years. And then on my first year of under 19s, that's when Atletico Porto Salvo came in. So. I had the option of staying with Kirkavellish, but a friend of mine from school had gone to Porto Salvo. And uh, in Portugal, with under-19s at the time, you don't have like an A team and a B team. You just have one big, one team. So you would have been, you would have had the second years as well, the older kids, you know, in the same team. Whilst beforehand, you always had the the under-15s B, the under-15s A. So that's like, under-15s B was like my age group. Under-15s A was the age group above. Sometimes you'd go play above, obviously, to keep testing and keep challenging as part of your youth football development. But um, it wasn't; it didn't always happen. And with the under-19s, it was very, very rarely would you have a first year as a starter. So I went to an under to the, my friend's team because they had a full squad of under-19s in the same league at uh, for, with first years. So I thought, okay, I'll go to the first year team because I've got more of a chance of playing. Exactly what happened. I had a full year there played every single game. I think I only missed one game because uh, my school football team, I was still playing for my school football team and we had international tournaments. So, that, oh, I got sent off once as well, actually, but that was <laughs> <another thing. laughs> yeah. 
So I missed two. I missed two games, and uh, one was for the international tournament. One was a uh, shambolic of sending off that I won't mention. <laughs> yeah, I, I have some of those too that I don't yeah, want to mention yeah. either. So yeah, Leo's we, we play on the same. You never do anything, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you never you do anything. Never it never your happens. Fault. Yeah, we, we play yeah. on the same school. F- well, we did. We graduated, but we did play on the same school football team as well. And I had a couple moments throughout my career that maybe I would take back, but it, it happens to the best of us. So. <laughs> You got to accept I, I, it. I remember that red card clearly. I don't take it back. The guy was still on goal. We were watching a lot of pushing. I pushed him. <laughs> on the day, it was like I didn't touch him, but today, I'm like, I pushed him. I fully pushed <laughs> him, yeah. Uh, so what, what position were you playing at that time then? Because you so said actually, striker at throughout, first, right? Yeah, so throughout Kirkevelus, I started as a striker and then moved to winger. And then on my last year at Kirkevelus, um our right back had a back injury and i was playing wing at the time and uh i remember my school football team i had a manager and i'll mention him Rui Gonsalves, because he's one of the top managers i've ever had he's actually out at al hilal now in saudi arabia oh, really really with their youth team i think okay but he was a top top class manager and he i remember he started playing me as a right back to the school team so i was playing as right back to the school team and winger for the uh Velus. But then that game, because he had a long-term back injury, I said, you know, I play right back already. I might as well try it, see how it goes. Probably one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. <laughs> I don't regret it at all, and I'm so glad I've done that. Uh, I ended up playing right back that season, and after that, that's when I went to England. So things really worked out on that year. Yeah, definitely. It, it says on the transfer market profile as well, you went from uh, Porto Salvo to Liverpool Football Club Foundation College. Now, yeah. a lot of people know Liverpool Football Club, but Foundation College, I, I think most people listening as well as us are curious to, as to what that is. Is it a branch of the academy? Is it academy plus schooling? Because I know that there are some, some places out there that school people like do college and then also do football. Like what, what yeah. in essence is it? It's similar to that, actually. It was a branch of um, it was a branch from Liverpool at the time, and it was run by academy coaches. And uh, one of the progressions was obviously to the the team. You know, if you if you did if you were outstanding, um, and other progressions was U.S. scholarship. So um, I've ended up going over there because a friend of mine was actually going to go over there with me, and he suggested it to me as well. And his dad made contact for me. And then I sent my footage, you know, I did like, I had to do player interviews and then um, my, uh, my dad had to do an interview as well. And then I had to get like referencing and stuff. It was actually like, it was actually a bit quite difficult at the time because uh, my dad wanted me to study and uh, he wanted me to go to university. So it was a difficult decision to make whether I just spend a year playing football because I'd already graduated from school. I had an option of not really like, you know, I could take the school bit a bit easier because yeah. I'd already graduated already qualifications so um after that i ended up spending that year there and that was the year where everything changed that was the year where i was like okay football is going to be my main focus now because um after that year uh that's when the offers started coming in so i had a couple of uh, u.s scholarship offers as well but i already knew that was maybe not the path for me and although it's a great opportunity uh, I think it's the way that you, that the U.S. has, you know, the, the education and the football and you're training full time and you put like the facilities are insane. And uh, I think it's an amazing opportunity for a lot of people. I was worried about graduating late uh, a couple of years later and not have any full time experience because I always knew that I wanted to play full time and yeah. I wanted it to be my job. But so when I finished that year, I had a trial at a club. I had a couple of trials at a couple of clubs, actually around England and uh, I also had the opportunity to go back and trial in Portugal in the third league but uh, my dad wanted me to finish my university Uh, so that's how I ended up in a couple of non-league football clubs so that semi-professional clubs around the Liverpool area because I was studying in Liverpool. I love the city so I ended up staying in the Liverpool John Moores University completing my degree and then uh, playing for semi-pro clubs because obviously the benefit of uh, the UK is how they've got so many competitive leagues. So you've yeah. got the, the Premier League, Northwest Counties League. So that was my area. Obviously, there's more around the country, but those are extremely competitive. And you know, you get a good mix of young players trying to make a name for themselves, as well as big time players who've already done it and are just you know keeping fair and just enjoying football because they still enjoy it. So it was a good combination of both. Uh, going back to Liverpool a bit more as well, 
that uh, that year I, I trained under John McMahon, who was one of, uh, I'm pretty sure, assistant manager for the LFC reserves when Rafa Benitez, and he assisted Benitez as well, I'm pretty sure. Okay. And, uh, so that was, he was an, an unbelievable coach that I got to be coached by, and another opportunity I got to go to over to the Dallas Cup. And that's uh, my, my nice little stop in Minneapolis. That's where that happened. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And we won, we won the Dallas Cup in 2017. Uh, what else did we win? We won the National Cup. So that was like the um, our, like our League Cup. And we nearly won the league, but our game was voided against Sunderland oh. because we were in the Dallas Cup. It wasn't cancelled, postponed. It was just voided. It just wow. ceased to exist. Wow. And I think if we played Sunderland, we would have maybe beat them and won that league as well. That's no. crazy. So uh, it would have been a really good year. <laughs> yeah, that that sounds incredible. I do have a question because you have experienced a lot of European football throughout your your childhood up until now, and then you go over to America and get to experience what youth teams in America are like level wise. How did you feel like it compared? Because it might be easy for you to say, but I think a lot of people in the United States don't really feel like they know the true difference between American academies or youth teams that are pretty high level over here. And then the difference between that and Europe. There are some fit boys in America. I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. The teams are so physically ready for anything. Yeah. Yep. They can run for days. I don't know. I think we played, um, I remember we played FC Dallas. I can't remember. I want to say Houston potentially as well. Okay. And, um, and then a couple of like academy, uh, academies as well, like development academies that we run into. I can't remember the exact names of all of them. So obviously these were like the bigger names that we play. So I remember them very clearly. Mm -hmm. But uh, from what I remember, there were some really like technical skilled players. So I don't know like what your skill development is coaching wise, but there were some really skilled players. Um, and the fitness was just <laughs> ridiculous. You know, the England's known for a fit game. It's not, they're known for a physical game as well. And uh, I've got to say, America's done that really well. I know the conditions at mo the majority of academies are really good. Because uh, yeah. obviously the facilities were incredible as well. It, so it was a really interesting experience for us. I remember we drew to FC Dallas, actually. That was our first game of the, of the tournament. And uh, I remember them having a really good side. I, d I don't know if I, who was playing at the time. I don't know if they're still playing. But I remember they had a really good side. And um, it, was a, <laughs> it was a couple of difficult fixtures. We managed to, to get, get through to the finals extra time as well so I remember the semi-final it was an American team as well I can't remember who it was but they obviously took us extra time as well so it was a really competitive tournament and we watched a lot of other games and there was a lot of talent in America yeah so I think I think we're going to start noticing now obviously in the World Cup and the next coming years we're going to start seeing uh, more players come about so I'm excited to see that as well it's nice to see more competitiveness in these competitions yeah we are too and I it's funny that you say that you know, the U.S. teams were very physically fit because I feel like we both kind of had that idea too in the U.S. It's usually um, coaches, maybe high school and college, focus more on players that are physically fit, that are, um, they have like a good form, they have strength and everything instead of maybe looking more at the technical side or the soccer IQ side of the game. Um, and then also you said you had some scholarship opportunities in the U.S. for some colleges, and it is different in the U.S. because uh, you are pretty much playing not professionally for, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, um, while in Europe, you are you can be in academies and almost, you can play pro at those ages. So did you think uh, maybe playing college would set you back at all because of that process where you did have to play in those um, developing years where a lot of other players across the world are playing pro or playing in first teams. Um, what, what was your idea on that part of it? I think what I was worried about was just if I, if I ever wanted to go back to Portugal at the time, I don't think they would have, would have understood the concept of uh, college football, you know? Yeah. So I would, have had, I would have had to explain why I've got no professional experience at that age. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think the competitiveness is less. There's plenty. Players play in, in England now playing National League and the, even I think the potentially a League Two that have actually played college college soccer and then either got drafted or uh, went on a draft on a trial and then didn't stay at a club and then went back to, to England. 
Uh, James Belshaw, I think is, that's his name. He's a goalkeeper. He's a really good example of someone who did really well in the college system and then went up over to the National League and he's had a decent career as well. Um, so it is possible, but I was, because I always intended to go back to Portugal at some point for a year, I was just worried that they wouldn't understand the concept of it because in Portugal, obviously, you've got the academy system and it develops some incredible players. Uh, all the Portuguese Premier League player uh, teams, I would say, have really strong academies, and it would have been really hard for me to compete with players leaving those academies for a place in like the third league or the second league. So that's was my my thought process throughout it. I was just a bit concerned about finishing. Obviously, it would have given me completely different tools. I would have left a degree. Yeah, uh, I exactly. would have been, been able to stay stay in America. Maybe I would have had some like USL League Two experience. So that that could have been beneficial for me as well. Um, it sh it, I just thought it was a risk for me. Yeah. I, th I thought I'd have to get a, a different base. Because um, I feel like with my path into football, it was always like a professional football career that wasn't meant to happen through the through the process, you know, through the the path that it was. It just wasn't meant to happen. And I just kept forcing it and kept like battling for it. And eventually it did. Yeah. Because uh, even when I was like playing school football and stuff, there was like loads of other kids where everyone was looking at them. Uh, I remember Sporting was chasing the centre mid in, in my team for years. And, uh, you know, he's not playing football anymore. And I'm, I am. And uh, a lot of other players that I played with chased by everyone, by every top club in Portugal. And now they're not playing football anymore. And I am. And um, yeah, it's huge. And like, it just, it's really cool for someone like me. And I think a lot of our fans or, or listeners who are listening if they have a similar mindset to hear that because I'm someone who's also I don't talk about it often on the podcast but I'm chasing a professional dream at some point and it's felt like that for me for a, a long time in my youth development trying to fit you know a square peg through a round hole you know always trying to force it you're never quite there everyone else is getting scouted but as you continue to push it you see yourself progress slowly and slowly to the point where the other players that might have been better than you or might have had more potential than you fall off and do other things and it might not be because they couldn't get to where you are but i've noticed it's just because you have that drive that's different from other people and so it's agree. yeah it's so cool to hear someone else who's farther along in their career and, and is very established to be able to say that because i think it, it's reassuring for me although this isn't a podcast about trying to become a pro it's reassuring <laughs> for me as well as everyone else who might be listening who has this, a, a similar dream that that you can do it you just have to keep pushing yeah so yeah that, that's about, really cool like what i always say is it's about surviving the filter every year yeah. players are filtered you know it's like you're pouring a massive uh like a massive bowl of something through a little tiny funnel and it's spilling everywhere and some stay and go through that's uh it's, it's just surviving that filter every year and even for me now i've come to finland who's to say that it's going to continue next year you know i've got to, i've got to fight for it i've got to fight you know that filter and uh, manage to like push myself into something else it's um it's always surviving that filter every year and uh, it's important to just be resilient network i think that's the best thing i can say to everyone just network early network with everyone this finland came for me because i networked if i hadn't networked if i just you know waited for that uh, option to come up it would have never come up uh <laughs> Yeah, 100%. It, it's so important. Networking, making Have sure you keep proactive. working hard, making sure you, like you said, proactively put yourself in a position where you can be inside the filter, where you don't get pushed out of the funnel. Make sure that you're positioned in a place where even if other people might be better than you or other people might have more skill or, or more physical attributes or anything that might be a little bit above your edge, you know, that they might have a little bit more than you. If you position yourself better than them to make it to the next level, you're going to get there. Um, and, and so yeah. it, it's really good to hear. I, I had one thing sort of just like moving away from, from this specific conversation, just cause I wanted to ask, and I saw this picture on your Instagram <laughs> from like however long ago, uh, and it was you in Portugal holding an Ezekiel Shalado jersey that he gave you or something like that. I don't know how it happened, but I just needed to know. So I'm a huge Brighton fan. Like, I have been for a really oh, wow. long time. Yeah, I have been for a really long time. He's a Southampton fan. Yeah. I'm a Brighton fan. Southampton okay. and Brighton. Yeah. And so I know a lot about Ezekiel Shalado because 2017 <laughs> to 2020, after he was at Sporting, he was at Brighton. So how did yeah. you get that jersey? Like, how did that connection even form? So I, I asked, I was at the front row of the stadium and I just literally asked and uh, really? Really? He, wow. yeah. he yeah, just he tossed it over the side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He seems like uh, a good guy. 
I, I'd messaged him. I'd messaged him beforehand as well. So we, it was like it was a well planned thing, and you know they knew where I was going to be, and it worked out. I've also, as well as that, I've got like a, a Slamani shirt as well. Oh yeah, and he went on to play Leicester, so he's gone back to Sporting. I was really excited for that, but it's not really worked out. Something's happened in the background. I'm not sure exactly mm-hmm. what happened, but he was one of my favorite players that, that's gone past Sporting as well. And uh, Marcos Rojo, I don't know if you remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. he went past United as well. He was at Sporting. I brought his top as well. And, really? Uh, yeah, it's it's in Portugal. It happens quite a lot. Yeah, really. That's and, so uh, cool. You make like the right presentation games and stuff like that, where it's more for the vibes, more for like the connection with the fans and. That's how those have happened. I was at this Matt point, Sheldon, yeah, that's what I was going to say. At this point, I don't know whose jersey you don't have. Yeah. You have a Matt Sheldon jersey <laughs> from the USL Championship that's signed. Yeah. Marcus Rojo, Ezekiel yeah. Shalada, like everyone. You make it seem so easy. <laughs> it's just like, oh yeah, I asked. I, yeah, I, just, him. I messaged him and, and like, he yeah. gave me his jersey. Yeah. I'm going to do that with Messi tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's a good lesson, yeah. No, it is. I mean, asking generally can get you something and and most people don't i mean it, it seems quite simple but most people don't get it you'd be surprised how many times it works <laughs> yeah it's crazy like most people are like oh he'd never respond just try yeah like why not yeah, yeah. why the not no is always guaranteed you're always guaranteed to know if you psych yourself out it's it. true ask, you might, you might at least get asked yes you know you don't know yeah 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 totally so Okay, now I, I got my question out of yeah. it. I just needed to know the where the Shalada jersey came yeah. from because I had that connection <laughs> in my head. Um, moving back to England and your non-league experience. So I see on here you played for the likes of AFC Liverpool, Lancaster City, uh, St. Helens. I don't know if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing all of these right. Yeah, 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 um, yeah perfect. And, uh, and Garstang FC. So these are all non-league teams or within the football realm of like not EFL teams within England, correct? Yeah. So that most, actually most of those teams are Northwest counties. Uh, one of them was Northern Premier League. And, uh, but between them as well, there was one that would have been in my youth career, which was Fleetwood Town. Uh, so I went over to the, I went over for a month because Fleetwood Town, uh, Fleetwood Town's Academy is two minutes away from uh, my girlfriend's house. Oh, so, really? Okay. Uh, in Thornton, Cleveland. So I saw that they were doing this like, academy thing and uh, I, I knew one of the people there so i just literally emailed them and went to train with them so they were bringing like internationals from all over the all over the globe really they had like quite a lot of americans canadians all sorts coming in to train for you know like uh, get a bit of coaching experience in europe and then go back to wherever so i was i wasn't doing anything in the summer so two minutes away from my girlfriend's I was like i'm gonna do that from that then i went over to lancaster uh, so one of our coaches was a coach at Lancaster City. So I went over with him, trialed, and then ended up staying. But the, um, I was I played mainly with their under twenty threes at the time, and the manager left. I think he went to a Northwest Counties team at the time. So when he left, I left as well, and then went to over to Garstang. So okay. Garstang gave me first team experience, uh, which was what I needed at the time. I was I was young still, and I needed to get a bit of men's football experience and see what it was like. But during that, I went back to uni. So university, I was studying sports business at Liverpool, John Morris. Okay. The commute from, the first time I also trained in Lancaster and it was a bit of a drive for me from Liverpool. I think it, like on a Tuesday, Thursday night, that's how semi-pro schedules work. That was like a two hour drive. Um, it was very, but, and if there was traffic, I literally wouldn't even make it on time to training. So I remember once uh, me and a guy that was from Liverpool as well that I took with me to Garstang, we were in my car, we were driving over to, to Lancaster to train. And once we hit the M6, which is a motorway that connects Liverpool and the, like that area, uh, there was like, it was completely gridlocked, traffic everywhere, wasn't even moving. And that's when my manager texted me, he was like, yeah, you're probably not going to make it on time. You might as well turn around. Mm. So I was like, it was, I think one. it was, yeah, it was, it was tough because I was just breaking into the team. And then oh, there goes my starting 11 spots because this is happening, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I took a very difficult decision for me at the time. I had to find something closer. So St. Helens was a 20 minute drive from mine, a lot closer, still in the same league. So I went, I trialed, the assistant manager was Portuguese and that's how the connection came along. And I, it was nice to have, you know, I haven't been home in a while as well. So it was nice to have people from Portugal and we had a couple of Portuguese players as well. So I went over there and uh, played a couple of games for them. And then, uh, I played for their 21s as well because their 21s played in the Northwest Under-21 League. 
week and which had like Tranmere Rovers had their uh, 21s team as well Macclesfield Town before it went bankrupt the first time had their team in there so it was a bit of a competitive league so I'd get a game with the first team on Saturday and then a team with the 21s on Sunday nice. so we lo- loads of game time what I needed at the time you know yeah. get my fitness and all that yeah and then so that finished as soon as oh I think the season got cancelled because it was the beginning of COVID oh, we went yeah. into that first lockdown I think that's what it was so the season was null and voided gone never existed once again something is voided in my in my yeah. career <laughs> yep there's, there's a pattern here yeah and that's where uh, the difficulty started uh this is where an interesting part of my career started which was finding a full-time club i've graduated from university my agreement with my dad is complete i can now pursue football completely so i must have sent over 500 emails over that uh over lockdown conveniently yeah. over the, the summer covid nobody knows how contagious it is at the time they were saying you have to wash your vegetables and if you touch the, <laughs> if you t- touch the button in the lift, you'd have to go wash your hands instantly. You know, you couldn't buy toilet paper for whatever reason. I'm still not sure. Yep. No, one's, no one knows about why that happened. <laughs> it was just a really confusing yeah. time of everyone's lives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I so you have kind of this theme where university or education has been in your life and whether that's uh, your father, you know, wanting you to continue that or it's you staying in Liverpool to study even though your team is two hours away um it seems very important to you and I'm wondering um you know what's the value in it to you and why were you so focused on like getting a degree was it more oh if this football thing doesn't work out I'll have you know a backup I'll have this good education or is it more you're focused on like a good balanced life where yes you do have the education and the football and not one or the other I also know you did say that you were interested in what we were doing because yeah. it was sort of the sports media side of things. And that's actually sort of the degree that I'm pursuing. Um, Max, more business, but I'm more sports media, communications, all of that. So like for me, at least, it's it's very like important for me to also have that to, to fall back on and also to do when I'm older. So I'm yeah. like Max, like, just curious how you think about that. So the uh, my degree is sports business, Liverpool mm-hmm. John Morris. But while I was doing my, because we have like um, work experience modules, so, so it was called sports business in practice, where you go into like go into a place and you know you're learning. And I remember we had like places that were offered. I asked them, can I find my own? And I contacted AFC Fylde, which is a national league club. club. It was at the time now it's a national league North club, unfortunately. But uh, which is a club close to my girlfriend's as well that I used to watch a couple of times. So the head of media there, Luke Lamborn, super cool guy, he said I could come in and do my work experience there. Um, so I ended up doing my work experience with them throughout my whole uni degree. So oh, that really? was, I got my degree with sports business, I got the sports media side in the media team doing that work experience with them. And that's where my interest came along. So some days I'd be with them uh, all day and then go to football and um, train. Uh, so that would be like my work experiences, like Wednesdays and Tuesdays, and it was I got it was really cool because I had like uh, a lot of my features published in their programs. A lot of the, my features are still on their website. Even while I was playing professionally in Portugal, I was still writing features and stuff for them because I think it's important to get that side of things as well because you never know when football when things can change. Uh, so I had I remember in Portugal I had a groin injury. Uh, it was it wasn't great. It wasn't looking good uh but eventually I, I recovered and then after one i went on to have a bit a couple more issues with my abdominal area so every time something like that came along i was like oh i mean i gotta grab my education so it's, yeah. it's important i think and I, i've heard this because on sundays i do a like a, a panel with a couple of like other football coaches and players and whatnot and we just do like interviews and everything and what every player says in common every professional football i've interviewed some have played scottish premier league some have played like the football league what they all have in common is they have you, you have to have your plan a your plan b your plan c your plan d for if football doesn't work out and uh i know not everyone likes to think about that because a lot of people think that if you have a plan b you're not fully committed to your plan a True. So I've heard that a lot of times, but personally, I think it's, you know, it's important to have your education as well. Yeah. Because football, if, you know, it doesn't last forever. Um, and not everyone has that intention of coaching or scouting or whatever. So it's good to have that degree as well to fall back on if you choose to. Yeah. And did you ever like feel settled down at all? Because it seems like the English football leagues and all of that, and we've talked to another player before on the podcast about it, but 
it seems like you're going from one club to another and, you know, emailing and, you know, grinding it out so much. Is it exhausting to you and like that process or did you like the grind and like the hustle to get to where you wanted to be? Because it seems very unique to England where you yeah, can true. you can yeah. move up the leagues very fast, but you're never at a club for more right. than like a year or so when you're just bouncing around but did you enjoy that process or was it more stressful for you it is it is pretty stressful i think for me the major stress was during the pandemic when you know when i was doing all those 500 emails so i was going all across europe at that point mm. and uh, not many responses and it's like obviously with the uncertainty of covid it's just the timing for me a lot of people yeah. were saying oh uh we can't like we can't recruit players right now because we don't know what's happening with our squad because of COVID. We don't know if our league's even happening. So that was like the major concern at the time. So I was like, oh, now that I can finally commit to full-time football, am I going to be able to find something? Because nobody's like opening their squads up for trials because of the because of the pandemic. I found it so exhausting, <laughs> like emailing yeah. nonstop, nonstop and just rewriting emails, you know, nagging people. But it, it, it comes back to what I said. Don't ask, you don't get. So exactly. yeah, and it's part of the coin. It's part of the starts. And uh, that networking is important because you never, all it takes is one yes. And you, you have to live in that hope, no matter how many rejections, no matter how many people ignore your emails, you have to live in the hope that one yes will come because it's all it takes. Yeah, it is. But it, it's, it's like amazing. exhausting. <laughs> yeah. It, it's definitely exhausting. I'm sure anyone listening who is listening uh, from the U.S. and has been through the college yeah. recruiting process yeah. as well as a U.S. student athlete can it understand is, yeah. the, the exha exhaustion that it takes to find a college program, um, especially people who have done it recently with COVID, similar to what you're saying, just the networking. It's, it's so difficult and it takes oh. a toll on you. It's crazy. But you did luckily find a team in Portugal. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it so i'll just let you pronounce it because i don't i don't <laughs> want to like mess anything up here um but yeah. you did find you did find a team after covid it says here that you jo joined them on july 1st 2020 um in portugal so what was that team what was that experience like was it good to be back home uh near your family and whatnot just give us the lowdown on that experience so actually that was not the first team i went to oh, when really? uh, when portugal through um, a friend of my dad who worked at Sporting Lisbon for a really long time, uh, I got a trial at a club called Estoril Praia. Okay. So they are currently in the Portuguese Prem, but at the time they weren't. They were in the second league, I think. So I got a trial with their B team, uh, and I would have been quite happy to, to stay there, to be honest. But I did the first two days with them, and uh, there was like 40 people on trial. And uh, apparently, this, I, I've heard from a friend that's just on trial with a second league club with their 23s. And apparently, it's a really common thing okay. that they bring like 40 people on trial or something ridiculous like that at wow. once. And I was on the pitch for like two minutes and then would come off and then would come back on for two minutes. And I don't think that worked. <laughs> <laughs> you can't show <laughs> anything if you're only on yeah, the field for that long. That's yeah, terrible. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think it really worked for me. So I did the first day of training and then the second day of training. And then I got a call from Oliveira. And uh, Oliveira said, okay, we're starting on this day. Uh, if you want to come down, you know, we can train. The manager, who was a top guy, I absolutely love him. And uh, he's actually just gone to manage a second league club in Portugal now. And I'm really excited for him to get that opportunity. His name is uh, Mr. Doze Marek. So he's a Portuguese football legend. He's played for a really long time. He's got, like, great numbers, top, top striker. Played in, I want to say, Switzerland. Played Spain as well. He's got, like crazy background so i knew he'd been announced as a manager as well yeah so when i got the call from all the i was like oh my god this is going to be class i'm going to be touched by this guy yeah and uh i went to train with them and uh it was it was it was tough it was a different a different completely different thing from english football i wasn't expecting uh what what, what i found like, technically everyone was so strong like there was no mistakes on them technically even like the goalkeeper's feet were insane so they could just do things so quickly, you know, two play one touch, two touches. It was nothing to them. It was just so natural. And I'd come in, I was, I want to say 21 maybe. And, you know, it was just a whole different experience to anything I'd experienced. In, in the, so that's, in a way, is kind of what I had going for me. Whilst everyone was like super technically sharp, I was fit. I was fast. And I got there and I was just 
running, pressing, pressing, pressing. You know, I, I, I could run nonstop. And I think the manager liked that. He liked my aggression. And the other thing they had going for them is it's really difficult for the, the club to recruit local players from Oliver Hospital. Even though like my, I'm from Cascais, my mom's side of the family is from Oliver Hospital. Mm. So for them, they looked at me as like, oh my God, a local player, fantastic. And, uh, you know, they, they only have like, a, it's not a big town, it's a small town. So they don't have access to that many players. So this guy is just literally fallen from the sky from England <laughs> in the middle of Oliver Hospital. These guys are like, this, this is fantastic. It's perfect for us. Yeah, it yeah. fits with their philosophies. Yeah. So the manager, um, I remember the, at some point mid July, the president uh, called me to come for a meeting, and uh, they said, you know, the manager wants to keep you. He loves you. So uh, if you want to stay, you know, you can stay. And I signed on that day, and I was so excited. That was going to be my third league experience, and uh, that was my first year full time. And nice. I'm forever grateful. Um, to Dosei Marek for giving me that opportunity. Yeah, um, yeah. It was it meant a lot. And, you know, even though I didn't get much game time, to, for me, it was just part of being there and learning. You know, I was learning from everyone around me. I was like a little sponge. I was just listening to what the manager said about me. And the manager actually, like, appreciated me a lot because I wasn't, I wouldn't moan, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't complaining, you know, I was just listening. I was just engaging. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was a training player, but I don't care. I learned so much in that year that, you know, I got opportunities to to go back to England, so yeah. which is uh, what I needed. Nice, and yeah, I think that's a good um, story to tell because maybe you're not obviously you're a right back, so it's harder to maybe get recruited because you're not a striker who you can just look at. Oh, goals, <laughs> assists, games. Like, is he good or is he not? With a right back, it's different. I play right back and center back as well, and I think you said it perfectly like just hard work and just listening and being a very coachable player just gets you very far even though you're not you know a striker who's scoring five goals a game and something like that it still it still works if you're like if you're working hard like that's gonna put you somewhere in life and i i respect what you were saying about that but yeah yeah it's super super cool um so that was third league experience correct in in portugal for anyone yeah. knowing so there's obviously the Liga Nos. Do you guys call it the Liga Nos in Portugal, or do you just say like Portuguese yeah. Premier League? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah no, it's just called Liga Nos. Yeah. 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 So there's the Liga Nos, a... and then there's the we actually. Like, yeah. So how it works now? It's at the time Oliveira was in the Campeonato de Portugal, so at the time that was the third league. Okay. Uh, we came second, unexpectedly. Our objective was avoid relegation. Uh, we came second in the league, wow. got promoted. Uh, and then actually we, we went to like the promotion playoffs and then we got promoted. We came first in the, the promotion playoffs. What we weren't expecting was the FA to announce the creation of a new league called Liga 3. So we came, even though we came second and what we should have been fighting for promotion to the second league, usually what ended up happening was we got promoted to the Liga 3, which is still good, which is still a promotion. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, deep down, we know we could have been fighting for Liga 2, which would have been so exciting. Yeah. But at the same time, Liga 3, crazy. I mean, we were so happy when we got promoted. It was actually, I'll never forget this game. I was, um, it was a 97th minute goal wow. to tie the game. And it was, uh, if, if, we had, if we had lost that game, the other team that we were playing against would have gone up instead. Wow. Must and have been limbs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> what a, it, was, it, it was crazy. We had massive celebration that day. And uh, the day after, I think, I went back to Lisbon and then I went back to England because my girlfriend had stayed in, in England. She didn't come to Portugal with me. Well, she came sporadically, but then went back. And obviously, she couldn't come back to visit because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, but it was literally like, I think what happened was the one of the other players in the other team went down, like fake, time wasting, faking an injury. And uh, he obviously, because it wasn't a yellow card, it was a corner, he had to come off. Oh. So when he came off, that meant three man in the box. The guy that he probably would have marked smashed it. Top bins header. And the wow. uh, promotion. <laughs> there it is, promotion, promotion right there. It, yeah. It's interesting. The the switching of leagues kind of reminds me. I, I'm drawing a lot of US comparisons here. Yeah. But it does remind me, especially because the US is so young in its football development right now. But it reminds me of the US league system, how like five years ago 
there was what was called the NASL and then the MLS and NASL was second division. And then they announced that the NASL was folding and a new league was coming in, which is now the USL. And the USL now has three divisions within it. First, uh, USL Championship, USL 1, and then USL 2. And then there's now a new league called the MLS Next Pro, which is now also third division. So there's, uh-huh. yeah, it's yeah. crazy. So there's, is, there's yeah. all of these pro leagues. There's also the NISA for anyone wondering, which is also third division. So technically in the US, there's three leagues that are considered third division, which is kind of weird. Like that doesn't make any no, yeah, sense. It's not actually third division then, but that's how they do their tier system. And there's, there's no, no promotion yeah. relegation. So there's no like point to have like a tier yeah, system. It's, it's weird, but it does kind of remind me of that with like the yeah. shifting of leagues that you guys experienced there. I also to hear about this, though, because like I, 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 it's hard for me to get a, an inside point of view of all this, yeah. all, all the leagues as well. Do you find that there's a lot of opportunity then for for players um, to find clubs? Yes, I would say if I'm going to describe it as quick as possible, the U.S. league system is so difficult to comprehend (laughs) because there are what uh, there's six professional leagues within the United States that are fully pro. And then there are a lot of semi-professional leagues under that. So there's semi-professionally, there's a ton of opportunity in the U.S., but the U.S. doesn't like it's it's. I don't think there's great upward mobility from the semi-professional leagues within the U.S. They okay. do. There are some good teams that do a good job of housing their players and making sure they're taken care of and everything like that. But I don't think the upward mobility is great, although there is some. But because there are so many pro leagues within the United States, I do think there is opportunity. You just have to be good at networking. Like you said, the networking is like the most important okay. part. Yeah. But, I mean, there's probably over 100 teams that are oh. fu- fully pro now yeah. in, in the U.S., that if you network right, you can find one. And I think they, they really enjoy Europeans. If you're looking to go no, over there, yeah, the US just is gi- still, giving you a, a little inside look, they do like Europeans. They're still focused lot. on recruiting. I, I would go yeah. in a heartbeat. Yeah. yeah. And my, honestly, with the fact my green card uh, coming in eventually, I'm sure that's yeah. a big benefit. Yeah. You know, The only thing I would say that well. they lack a lot is once you get down to USL1, MLS Next Pro. MLS Next Pro is a little bit better because it's the reserve teams of the MLS yeah, teams. Yeah, it's usually just... So they like have decent yeah. decent facilities. But in the NISA, which is third division, and the USL1, they don't have the best facilities. It's fully pro. It's a, a good experience because for some teams, like if you play Monterey Bay Union, which is in uh, California, you can be in, like located in a good place um, and, and in a cool area. So like those things are good, but your facilities, you're usually playing on a turf high school or college field that they like sort of make into a soccer facility for the season. That's the only thing I would say is the problem with the U S lower divisions of professional specific. There's not a lot of soccer specific (laughs) facilities once you get that far enough. Yeah. And that's because they haven't been around long enough to make enough money to build those facilities. Yeah. Do you think that it's one of those where in the next coming years, everything's going to be redeveloped so much. I think slowly. I don't think in the next couple of years you're going to see every team, but I think slowly you're seeing each team building more facilities. I'm seeing USL1 teams building training facilities right now, and slowly they'll get game facilities. I think probably half or more than half of USL1 has actual soccer-specific stadiums, and then for the NISA, it's a little bit less because the NISA is a little underdeveloped compared to USL1. Yeah. But it like it's decent. It's just it needs... I would say my estimate would be five years or a little bit more. I think soccer in general is just on that like upward climb in the U.S. So I think with that, it's just going to come more development with soccer stadiums. Because right now, like in any like U.S. town, it's there's baseball fields and basketball courts. But I think we would hope to see maybe more soccer fields being built there's or... a lot of multi-purpose fields yeah turf fields you yeah. can find places to train really easily in the u.s but they're not soccer specific no yeah so i hope with that development in the next years um i could see that definitely happening but, yeah, yeah definitely yeah. that's a struggle i had in the uk actually like it was difficult for me to find the just like a random pitch for me to go train in it's, yeah uh, i've most heard the, that a lot, lot. Quite tough, actually. Yeah. It's interesting. They, they say they lock up the fields like all over yeah. the UK. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and, and it, when I came over to Finland, literally, there's like a grass pitch about like two, <laughs> maybe three minutes away cycle from my house, and it's just 
pristine grass. Yeah, that's that's and what I'm saying. The, Even here, are that the nets. and I look at that and I think, oh my god, if that was Portugal, some guy would somehow be carrying that goal and fight. <laughs> yeah, <they'd> be, <laughs> exactly. Be no, it's, yeah. it's the same here. I, three yeah. minutes bike ride, probably from where we are recording in the studio right now. You could find three AstroTurf pitches with six goals on them each. Yeah. It's crazy. I'm going to get my bike ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe we'll see you down here. I think that there's there's a possible chance. Yeah, you never is. know. <laughs> um, we do want to talk about uh, after Oliveira de Hospital. Did I pronounce that right? I know I have a lot of pronunciation yeah. questions. Yeah, was was that decent? Like okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. after that, you went to Kevin Druids in, in Wales, correct? Yeah. So I was actually meant to go to another club. Um, I feel like we, we see a repeated cycle here. Yep. <laughs> I was meant to go to a different club. And uh, I'm not going to name and shame the club because what they did to me wasn't very nice. Hmm. Um, it was a, a really good level, a really good level in England, full time again. And I was going to go again for their 23 slash B team reserves, whatever it's called, and hopefully develop and then get a chance in the first team. And I would have been playing a really good league in England. But a couple of days, so they basically told the agent that was sorting it, yeah, so we're signing him. Uh, we, we want him to come, and um, he can come sign on this day, which was a 19th of July. I'll never forget that day because my heart was broken like four days before. Anyways, oh. <laughs> um, we already found the flats. Uh, my friend had a, a job pretty much lined up. Uh, everything was pretty much sorted, and they called up again and said, uh, I'm really sorry, but we've gone a different way. So they called up the agent, the agent called me and he said, look, it's, I'm really sorry, it's not going to happen. They've uh, pulled out and they've gone with a different option. And it was uh, someone released from the top league in, in England, so it was a very difficult competition, but I, I understand its decisions. Mm. And uh, that left me in mid-July with no club to go to. So obviously, panic went back in. I had an intention of staying in the UK because I knew my girlfriend didn't want to go abroad. So uh, I wanted to have, like, obviously I'd just been away for so long, I didn't want to have to leave again. So I had to find something in the UK, and it wasn't until the, I want to say, mid-August, I started training with, with Kevin Druids, and then on the final days of August, I signed with them. So that was going to be, again, really exciting for me, because it's a Welsh Premier League. So yeah. it would have been the chance to play in a top-top league. You know, the, the, the club chairman was mentioning the chance of playing in Europe as well. So it's something like Europa League, Europa Conference League, which was coming up the year after, I think, as well. Champ obviously, Champions League is difficult, but it would have been really nice to play in the qualifiers as well. So it was a really good goal for me. And it, it sounded like an ambitious option for me. So it was a no-brainer at the time. And I, I signed for it. And I was really excited because I was, I was like, okay, I'm in the third league. I was in the third league last season. I'm in the Premier League now. Progression, you know, that's what yeah. I wanted. Yep. And then, um, unfortunately, things didn't quite work out. The manager that I'd signed with left uh, literally a couple of weeks after I signed. He resigned um, and then I got injured and it was uh, uh, something happened in my abdominal. It sounded like a torn abdominal. I'm not really sure what happened. Uh, basically, I was warming up for a game and I took a shot and it just didn't feel right. It was like the, my, my whole lower abdominal area was just in a horrible pain. And after the, after the game, we didn't have a physio, so I saw the, the physio and the, the other team's physio. And um, he uh, felt it and he said it could be a hernia. So I, he recommended I'd go to A&E and get a check. So I went to hospital and I was waiting for like 14 hours. Oh, and wow. uh, eventually I got checked. You know, I was By the time I got checked, this was after a game. I was knackered. Um, like my girlfriend was waiting in the car outside the whole time because of COVID. They didn't let her in the hospital. So I was on my own in the, like... I was living in Wrexham at the time, so that was new to me as well. So obviously I had to move for the club. Yeah. And uh, it was a really difficult uh, day for me. And then they did the, the a couple of tests and blood tests and all sorts, and they didn't really find anything. So I had to go to a, another hospital and like get an actual ultrasound or whatever it was yeah. to get see and figure out what it was. They didn't find a hernia, but uh, they didn't really know what it was. So they just assumed it was a tear. Whatever it was, it kept me out for like a couple of months and that was my first serious injury ever it was really really not an easy period for me i was like really like unmotivated as well i was in the middle of like a different country i uh, only had my girlfriend um it was a really difficult time so i came back made a comeback in january and played a couple of minutes but there was a 
a couple of other issues and maybe like motivated by the injury as well some things went wrong uh and it wasn't quite working for me i was mm-hmm. i was really not i wasn't happy i was really upset and uh it was one of those points it was the first time where i was like pack, potentially packing football in that really? was i was very very close to like just not doing it anymore obviously there that's where the education comes in and my education yeah. i could yeah. do that not everyone in football has that luxury where they can just at any moment say okay now i want to do like marketing or business or whatever yeah and uh, so probably the first point of my career where i was like okay that was a good idea um eventually so i think on the transfer deadline day 31st of january i, I get a call and it's uh, Lu- uh, Luis Figueredo, the Cayenne in Hacker manager. So where I'm at now. And he was, we had, we'd been talking for a while about other things and just chatting football. And he was telling me about Finland and, you know, just, just networking, just speaking, nothing like no intention of me coming over here or him wanting me over here. It was just, just chatting, you know, learning about his experiences and whatnot. And then on the 31st of January, I, he said, he, now I know, but he called me as like a joke. So he, really? he, he's told me now that he called me thinking I would say no. So him and the chief scout were sat in the office and the president, they were like, oh, I've got this guy in the watch frame. I'm going to call him now. He's probably going to say no, but you know, if the no is always guaranteed. You don't, don't ask, you don't yeah, get. So he, yeah. he called me and I, I was in, I remember it vividly. I was driving with my girlfriend to Chester on my day off and uh, he was like, do you want to come to Finland? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and no questions like, asked. Yeah. Ticket book. Yeah, there's just like silence in the car. He was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, yes, when do you want me? <laughs> Obviously, after that, he talked to me about a bit about the project and he was like, well, like maybe I should have started with this, but I wasn't expecting you to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, he was telling me about the project. He was telling me, like, okay, you come here uh, full time, you know, you've got like, you've got the gym, you've got pool axes. So all that stuff I had to, like, when I was in the UK, I had to pay for it myself. All of that is included here. And so obviously we've got these crazy facilities. The pool is like an Olympic, I'm pretty sure it's an Olympic sized pool. You know, you got a diving board if you want to have some fun as well. You can have a water slide, but obviously like, wow. Thing. You go yeah, in the ice yeah. bath, and then go the hot water bath, and go for yeah. a swim and then go home in it. <laughs> necessarily mean that's what happens every time but <laughs> but that's like a day's that's training good. sometimes yeah sometimes, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes you, you gotta make the most of the, of the experience i guess but yeah. yeah so we had all the conditions you know it sounded perfect for me it's what i needed i was really down i was really upset i needed a change of change of scenery uh so i called my parents after that and they were like and i was like okay uh, hi dad i'm going to finland it's like you're going where sorry <laughs> oh, finland <laughs> i'm going to finland yeah. it was like you're not serious, are you? <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm going to Finland. I'm going there a couple of days. And he was, he was like, just come to Portugal first. So I, I, by then, I had like calls with the club. So I called my agent. I said, I need you to sort of release the contract. I'm going to Finland. He was like, you're going where? I'm going to Finland. Everyone's just, where uh, yeah. are you going? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then I remember like, I didn't really tell anyone that I was coming to Finland. And I just put up a post on Instagram. I'm in Finland. And all my mates were like, what <laughs> you were in wales like five days ago <laughs> yeah. literally i called my parents and my parents say okay release is sorted just come to portugal for a couple of days we'll talk about it we'll think about it uh i was like okay uh, i'll come to portugal i'll, I'll think about it in the, in, they didn't know i before leaving england already, they already signed the already contract signed it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so literally on my night before flying to, to to finland i signed the pre-contract scanned it sent it to to Haka so they could get everything sorted and i flew and my parents were still talking to me you know finland's really far away it's, it's <laughs> so snowy it's cold and i was like oh i know i know i don't know should i go should i go <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows if I'm like, gonna go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I haven't. And then they're, they're literally, you know, the, the club had already booked my flight to come over <laughs> before I, even, you know, before I even got to Portugal. I just told them yeah, I needed Lisbon, Helsinki. I'm going to Portugal for a couple of days and then I'll come. And my, <laughs> in the whole meantime, I was with my parents. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. They ended up coming with me, but I already really? knew I was going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, no change of ideas was gonna happen. Now yeah. it was happening. And that was probably one of the craziest things I've ever done. It was just spontaneously on a 20-minute trip from Brexham to Chester, decide, oh, yeah, I'm going to Finland now. 
That is so cool. It's crazy how, I mean, with, with all the interviews that we've done, we've seen sort of a pattern within this one and the other ones. Like when, when you're trying to pursue a professional football career, things can change in the blink of an eye. Yeah. You have no idea what's going to happen. And then five days later, you're playing for a team. And it's just how the profession works. It's how it goes. And there's never certainty, but if you love the game and you love the profession enough, you do it because it's worth all of the uncertainty and pressure and everything that's put on you, um, or at least the players that pursue it think so. Yeah. And so I think it's really cool to, to see that pattern sort of come alive with all of these, these interviews. Uh, we talked before the podcast about your, and we also talked about the U.S. a, a little bit um, during the podcast, but about sort of your desire to eventually be in the U.S. for a certain period of time. You have a Matt Sheldon jersey who, if people don't listen, or if people listening don't know, he is the guy who runs Become Elite. Yeah, he's <laughs> getting it out. There you go. It's actually yeah. signed. Yeah. He's, he's the guy who runs Become Elite, the YouTube channel, uh, which has training videos, vlogs about match days, everything like that. He plays for the Charleston Battery in the USL Championship. Um, so he knows Matt Sheldon and also has a desire to possibly play against him maybe at some point in time. So if you could just tell everyone about that, you know, sort of looking at your future in the industry. So I actually forgot to mention that before even Finland was an option, the US was an option. And uh, I was looking at the MLS Next and the USL. Mm -hmm. And one club actually told me that um, if I could get my green card sorted quickly, I could come straight away and it'd have me straight away and I'd be able to sign. However, and that was through that agent as well. My issue was that the green card, just my sister obviously lives in America, so she put in for the green card. And uh, we're just waiting and it never came on time. And uh, obviously I have to do something else in the meantime. Yeah. Whether it, if it comes eventually and that's an option, it's definitely something I'd love to do. Uh, I, I had a bit of a taste of it, obviously, when I was in Dallas. And I love the country. And uh, again, it was one, I literally, I, I remember this. This is so weird. So it's like end of December. And I had a dream that I was playing football in America. <laughs> and when I woke up and I was like, I need to go play football in America. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the dreams know, to like, reality. Yeah, literally, I just woke up and I was like, "That's that felt so that felt right. That was really weird." And I just woke wow. up in the morning. I was like, "I need to go play football in America. This needs this is what's happening now. I'm going to America." Yeah. And uh, obviously, I networked a bit, explored every option, and the majority of the time, the response. And that's how I like came across Matt Sheldon as well, and that's why I had the talk with him because he was telling me, obviously, if I had my green card, things would be a lot easier and. Uh, that that's where I learned a bit more about the USL and that's where I was like really studying everything. And uh obviously Fin green card never came, Finland came. I went to Finland. If the green card comes, it's something I definitely want to do. I think the everyone says the facilities are crazy. The I think physical development, I don't know what it I think one of my coaches has told me as well that sports nutrition wise and physical fitness wise as well, like strength and conditioning and everything. The U.S. is the best you can get. It is. Everyone, I have totally experienced that. Like it is, the yeah. science behind how they train you in the U.S. is just different. It's not – there's much less what you might call creativity or just trying to be creative and play possession and do all this kind of Tactical, stuff. Tactical, yeah. Ta like, yeah, just – I feel like you might find that more in Europe. Yeah. But in the U.S., they're going to feed you stuff that makes you stronger, and they're going to make you faster. They're going to correct your running form. They're going to do all of this stuff. And the great part about where you're coming from, which I, I could see, is you have that mind already for football. You already have all of that stuff that you need te technique-wise, and then they can push you to that next level with you know all of, all of the, the strength, conditioning, fitness, nutrition, everything that they can provide on that front. I think for me it was uh, as well because obviously I was in England for so long. I really developed my like fitness, you know, the the pressing, a bit of the yeah. football mentality. As well. But when I went to Portugal, my technical side progressed like crazy in that year, and the yeah. manager was picking up things that I'd never noticed, and my, even managers in the U in the UK hadn't noticed like little details because Portugal uh, football coaching in Portugal is great. They, they pick on details that. I have no idea what it is. I don't know if it's their education. I, I don't know what, like how they notice these things or where they pick up on these things, but they just do. So Portuguese coaches have an eye for like detail. So when I was out there, I improved that technical side. And then I came, went back to the UK. I was so much better technically. So I feel like having all these experiences um, technically, it will, would, would really help me now in the future. And then 
if I go to the US and I'll work on the, like the strength and conditioning side of things, you know, and get that opportunity, I feel like it's just going to make me like a lot more complete as a player. Yeah, it all builds on each other. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, you need to take like a little bit of everything, you know, yeah. and uh, shape, shape yourself. I don't know what it is. Like, I just, the US has such incredible strength and conditioning training. I don't know if it's like the education. I don't know what you guys are doing there that just makes like everything so strong in that department, honestly, because the, the, the nutritional side of things is, is an incredible. Like the, the sports strength and conditioning, the sports science in general in the U S is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And obviously the fact that you've got incredible facilities as well, you know, you put both of them together, you put the knowledge and the, the, the ability to put that knowledge into practice together. It just makes such a complete project. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons like I'd be so excited to go over there and just experience that. Totally. Yeah. I mean that it, it's, it's great, you know, looking at how you can build different with, with different scenarios. You can build yourself, picking from e- each scenario, trying to build yourself up. Um, and it's just so cool that, that you're trying to experience everything, get everywhere, see the world through football. I think that's another thing that football allows you to do. It just allows you to go, exp- like you're saying in in Finland, you can just go. You're traveling on, around the on world. the bus, yeah. take pictures of beautiful countryside, yeah. beautiful yeah. areas. So it it allows you to do a lot of things. Before we close. We have three quick fire questions and then two like closing questions to ask you. The closing questions we ask everyone. And then the quick fire questions uh, is just like answer as quick as you can. They're not super difficult to answer, but it's just like showing the people who you are a little bit. So do you want to start or do you want me to start? Uh, I can start. All right. So first one, would you rather have a game winning goal or a game winning uh, goal line clearance defensively? Mm. Oh, that's a really tough one. <laughs> game winning goal. Game winning goal. I'd game love to. Goal. I'd, I'd love to experience that. I've not experienced that yet. So, and I just okay. remember the link that last second in the yeah. in all yeah. the yeah. I want to. I want to hold that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, want to yeah, be yeah. the guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to be the one jumping into the stands. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what I'd do if I score a goal like this. Is an ongoing. Here, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just I was talking the other day about it i feel like i'd be running around with my shorts in my head and, uh, <laughs> i don't know how people keep like keep their cool in moments like that yeah yeah i just feel like it would just go all out the window the adrenaline takes over whatever you're just happens. running around the field in your underwear <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's the passion yeah <laughs> it's pure passion yeah all right the next one is and i know you you touched on this a little bit with the team bus ride bus rides so team bus rides versus team locker room time what's better Oh, I love our locker room time, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. It's yeah. it's bonding. Yeah, it's chemistry. Fun. Yeah, and, you know, the building, I enjoy it because our, our trips are so long, sometimes I end up having just a good sleep or, yeah. you know, but I, I love locker room time. Yeah. And that, those moments when it's building up to a game, incredible. And when, you know, that final whistle goes and you've won, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And then finally, uh, we think you met Bruno Fernandez at some sort of carnival or, or something. Like arcade or something. I don't know where Wait, this place yeah. was, but I saw LED lights in the background. Yeah, we need to know. We need to know what first, that was. First off, yeah. where was it? Second off, why was Bruno there? And third off, <laughs> was did he have security around him or people to make sure that he was like not getting crowded by others? No, me and Bruno Fernandez are shooting hoops in an arcade. In the, oh, the no, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Imagine, I wish. No, yeah, yeah. literally. At the time, Bruno Fernandez was sporting as well. Yeah. And this is like one of the coolest encounters I've, I've had. I've, I've had another one that I'll mention after as well, actually. And uh, Bruno Fernandez was a really cool encounter. I literally, I didn't even notice he was there. I was, I was walking and my nephew was over from America and uh, I was walking together with him. And uh, my dad just shouts me and he's like, oh, Bruno Fernandez is over there. And I was like, and I look back and then Bruno <laughs> Fernandez is just, and he's got like another Portuguese Premier League player with him as well. They're just both, I think they have their kids like playing in the arcade or whatever. And I was like, what? what what's going <laughs> was on? on holiday. I was on holiday. Oh. Or I was on holiday at the same time. So obviously that's the time of the year that I have to do my holiday because of football. And of, when you go to Villa Moura, which is like in the south of Portugal, at that time of the year, which is footballer galaxy, there's just footballers everywhere. Yeah. Because, you know, that's the time of the year that everyone gets their holidays in at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to meet football Portuguese footballers, go to Villa Moura uh, around to end of like mid-June. 
That's guaranteed crazy. Noted. Yeah. <laughs> I will be there next year. Yeah, we will be there. <laughs> <laughs> I just ruined the uh, Yeah, I just learned that this is where you find the footballers. Football. <laughs> Just ruined everyone's holiday. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be crowded. By crowded. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's like 400 Americans boarding it's a flight next Americans year in June that, yeah. to go there and meet football. That's the best thing that's ever happened to Portuguese tourism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's oh, in, I hope there's competition. Uh, uh, Portuguese going. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Contact me. We'll sort it. Get some, get some payment. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet, sweet. Well, that closes the so, quick fire round. You said you also had an, actually another person that you met. So yeah, when I was um, doing one of the international tournaments in my school football team, I actually ended up staying in Jose Mourinho's house. What? Wow. What? You know, his son played for another school, and then they were hosting us, and randomly drafted. I, I ended up there, me and okay. a couple of other friends. That's crazy. Okay, so we have to know. We have talked about Jose quite a bit on this podcast because we had an AS yeah. Roma match analyst on who worked closely with Jose Mourinho. So we have to know, yeah. for, for another YouTube clip about Jose Mourinho, was his house nice? Of course. <laughs> of course. It was of nice. course what was yeah. the best part about it? Just just the way they... The, the hospitality, the way they greeted us. Honestly, they really? were so cool. Uh, they are like... His family is like one of the like coolest group of people I've ever met, and really? uh, he was just one of the nicest people I've ever met. And his football knowledge is beyond me. I was just trying to like just listen, you know, just yeah, just, just like yeah. you know? just take it yeah, all. In. Yeah, there was like the hospitality was like they were so lovely. Honestly, the loveliest like loveliest people, and uh, the Greek they hosted us so well, and we won that tournament as well. And uh, obviously, that was nice. As, I ended up meeting with a uh, with his son uh, while I was in Liverpool, I think. So I traveled on to London, and he happened to be there as well. And we met up. He's such a cool guy. I've lost touch with him now, unfortunately, because uh, I've changed my phone. I've lost all my numbers. I don't know if he's uh, changed it either. Yeah. He, honestly, like the nice, some of the nicest people I've ever met. They were just that class is so cool. Yeah. And obviously, an enormous house considering they fit a whole football team. Yeah. <laughs> like that's crazy. Yeah. No, it was, me and uh, me and three other guys, three of the guys stay there, and then okay. the others stayed in other houses. And yeah. so you were the lucky one. You get everyone yeah. else is going to someone else. Yeah. Like, no, I'm going to Jose's. Uh, I'm going to Jose. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It was like random, we didn't even know as well. Like we, the the name on the paper was like another another name, uh, uh, which I'm assuming was like a point of contact or something. Mm -hmm. So actually, my parents because we, we I brought like a gift and stuff. I didn't even like my manager pulled me aside and he told me this was happening. And I didn't, he asked me not to tell anyone. I'm like, cool. I didn't even tell my parents. So in the the postcard and the gift, it said to the point of contact. So they wrote it to Mr. and Mrs. Point of Contact. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to like, when I got there, I opened the card. I was like, oh no. I had to like cross out the name. And cross the, it out, yeah. Yeah, the actual. Mr. Name. and Mrs. Mourinho. <laughs> yeah, I had to like cross the guy's name, the point of contact's name out and just like his, their actual name. And I was like, oh my God, they're going to read this and think I'm an idiot. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it was, it was fun. Yeah, he's ended crazy. up signing up my book as well because obviously I had his little biography. He's, he's my favorite football manager, so yeah. uh, I had Understandably. Like, I think, you know, for him to sign as well. My parents were like, oh, why are you taking that? I was like, I'm just going to read in the, the plane and that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just, some, just some reading, yeah. nothing. Yeah. Nothing yeah, specific. Just... <laughs> All <Yeah>. right. <laughs> that is such a cool story. That is. Two yeah. people who have met or worked with Jose Mourinho in the last two weeks. Yeah. Who would have thought? That's actually crazy all right we have to close the podcast with the two questions that we ask everyone the first one is related to our mission and it's the mission of our whole company which has other podcasts within the network as well and so the mission is to create a community of passionate football fans who highlight the classy side of the game keeping discussion positive uplifting and inspirational so with that mission as a podcast trying to create a positive and uplifting community what advice do you have for us or for our fans to help the footballing world become a better place. I I, th I think you guys are doing some really class things. I said in the beginning, uh, you know, you're you're getting this getting stories out, and uh, I, I feel like just just being positive. You know, the, the the conversation, everything. You know, we're just we're sp it's just everyone just spread positivity. It's a really tough industry, and it's it's really tough for footballers as well because you know the cool. What, 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 what is one of the coolest things about football at the same time for footballers it's also really difficult which is that everyone has an opinion and uh, you know you have, you have to deal with that so yeah. people have to remember you know everyone in football is a human being as well so you, you have to like as a footballer you have to be 
thick skinned and deal with it. But at the same time, you're, um, you know, get, getting so many people from all over the world involved. As you said, you've had analysts from Roma as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's just amazing to, to be able to get all these experiences and, and learn from everyone else as well. So just keep doing what you guys are doing because I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on it. So I'm so excited. I was so excited to hear about it. I'm so excited to see what, what else comes along. Yeah. So just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, Thank you course. so much, man. And then finally, why do we play football? The best, best sport in the world. Yeah. Uh, the, getting on that pitch is the best feeling in the world. And uh, I, I, a friend of mine, one of my teammates had a, like a long-term injury and he, he came back last weekend and he said like he literally had chills, you know, stepping onto the pitch. And uh, every, I'm pretty sure every player feels that. Yeah. And just he, the, watching games, you know, the links in the last second when there's a goal, uh, you know, seeing your favorite player score a winner, it's, it's unbelievable. We play football because it, we love it, because we have passion for it. And while that passion is there, I just think everyone should keep fighting for, you know, whether it's pro football, whether it's, you know, playing for fun, keep fighting for the opportunity to do so. Keep going at it, you know, while you love it, keep doing it because there is no greater feeling in the world. And that's why I play football. Yeah, well, that's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to hear. That's exactly what the people want to hear. Just everyone's opinion on why we play the game, everyone's opinion on their journey throughout the game. And I know you said that opinions sometimes can make life for footballers really hard, but I think also they can be a really beautiful thing where everyone can take something from every scenario, something from every situation and apply it to their own life to try to become a better person, a better footballer, better in their own profession, whatever that may be, and just overall live a better life. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories for everyone, sharing how crazy it is when you go from team after team after team, trying to find success all throughout Europe, sharing your ambitions and goals for the future and all the cool stories that you had along the way. We really appreciate that we were able to get it out to the world and we hope you have a great rest of your day. And if you ever have more stories to share, you're welcome back on the podcast. Thank you, Jose. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me guys. And thank you for what you're doing. Uh, Honestly, it means a lot to be here and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Everyone who's listening, have a good day and peace.